Welcome to The Passion Pod with your host, Chris Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the feature presentation. Welcome back, friends. Today we're in Los Angeles hanging out with another Midwest guy who came to L.A. to chase a dream that he's made a reality from buying his first duplex in Minnesota when he was 20 to $40 million in sales in a year. Welcome to the show, Gregory Eubanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, dude. I appreciate you pulling up because you're not in this zone, right? You're not from this area, Marina Del Rey. Uh, I'm close by. I'm like 10 minutes away. I live in like the Mar Vista, Venice area. Thankfully, I mean, for this, it seems like I'm a little bit far out. So when I've been scheduling interviews, some people are like, man, I don't know. That's an hour one way. This is going to be ruthless. Well, thanks for coming to the beach. So who are you in your own words and what are you passionate about? Uh, My name is Greg Eubanks. Um, I hail from Minneapolis, Minnesota, born and raised. Uh, Moved out to L.A. in 2010. So I've been out here 12 years and uh, came out here to follow ambition, follow passion, follow dreams. Minneapolis wasn't big enough? Minneapolis is definitely not big enough. It wasn't <laughs> hot enough either. Uh, so, yeah, I had to, had to get out of there. I, I, I think I was just one of those people that was designed. I couldn't live in the same place for the, my entire life. And sure. after each passing year, as I, as I turned into an adult, you know, that desire just continued to expand of wanting something different. Yeah, sometimes when you grow up in a certain space, too, like once you become an adult, it's kind of like a... this. A, this is that home nest. Like I got friends, I got family here, whatever, but I kind of want to build everything from nothing myself. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. You know, versus like if you're in your hometown, then all of a sudden it's like any random job you have, it came through a connection from this person or you know that, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't mm-hmm. quite feel like your own so much. So we were connected by our mutual friend, uh, Enrico Moses, who's also from Minnesota. So what's your connection to him? Why is he so rad besides, you know, the interview we did? Uh, me and Enrico, uh, we connected in high school. He was a couple years older than me. Uh, we went to Osceola Senior High School. Um, and I had just moved out there from like the inner city uh, in Minneapolis, so I didn't know anyone. And uh, it was a little culture shock for me, but once I got out there, I connected with a few people. And uh, from there, it was kind of history, you know, it turned into having a decent college or high school experience. Yeah, you played basketball and stuff, right? When you were growing yeah, up? Yeah, but I got cut in high school. I got, <laughs> yeah, cut. Sure. I got cut a couple times. So, so once you get cut, you, they, they demote you to like playing house league or whatever. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so then what did you do after you get cut? Where'd you put all your time and energy? Because oh, high school man. sports take up like all your time, right? You weren't just all of a sudden studying real estate when you're 16. I yeah, imagine. I wasn't. Um, no, I, you know, I, I had a great love for basketball. So even though I wasn't good enough, I mean, I was one of those kids that developed. Uh, slowly, so like in tenth grade, I was maybe five four, five five. I was just little, sure. Uh, so it's tough to make a varsity team at that. But you know, I, I had the skill set, I think, but I just didn't have the the size. Sure. And then I like blew up by uh, my like senior year, but it was too late by then. Um, so, so then, what did you do with your time then? Once you weren't playing basketball, did you get uh, into music, photography? Were you like I said, you're, you're in real estate now, but I can't imagine 16 yeah. in real estate. No, I still played a lot of basketball. I, mean, I worked. I mean, I was always a worker. I had my first job at like 12, 13 years old. I worked at this place called the Cookie Cart in Minneapolis, where they hired young kids and paid us $25 a shift oh, to God. bake cookies and sell it to the community. Oh, sure. So it was my first uh, job where I made money. Sure. And. Uh, you know that that just that started the whole just me being uh, having a strong work ethic and just want to make money and finding different ways to do so. So I always had jobs in high school. All right, you know I worked at Taco Bell, I worked at Target, worked at Papa John's. I was moving around, man. You you <laughs> bounced around a lot then. So then when you were graduating high school, what then was like the goal at that point in time? What did you want to do? Oh, I was definitely into academics. So you know I I, I left uh, high school. I think. I had like a 3.6 GPA. I got accepted into the University of Minnesota. See, I had like the same and didn't get into U. But you have been, I had to go to Duluth. <laughs> I didn't get into the marketing uh, college that I wanted to get into. Okay. Uh, I think that was Carlson. Uh, but I got into liberal arts. So I was like, that's a start. I'll start off general and figure it all out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I was, I was very school driven until I actually entered college and then kind of waned. Yeah, I mean, I think depending on what you want to do, especially if you're looking at business stuff like marketing, you quickly realize that it's about numbers and sales. It's not really about the paper, right? 
like getting a degree is nice and that's that's all fine and dandy but really it depends on like whether or not you're going to make this company money if they're going to hire you and so i was in sales for a long period of time right. and when i went to college i went to umd and i was on the dean's list and ace calculus and did that whole thing but i quickly realized i was like man i don't know that this is important because i had been doing sales since i was like 16 mm -hmm. and i like it kind of quickly clicked. I was like, you know, you're either good at selling stuff or you're not. Hmm. I don't know that going to college is like has a huge effect on that in particular. So I dropped out after a year and then just kind of moved up corporate ladder stuff. And I was in a cozy job by the time I was like 21, you know, because mm. I was just good at talking to people and I kind of yeah. figured out how to do it. Exactly. Eventually, I, you know, it hit me that I didn't, you know, I wanted to care about what I sold. So right, I, right. I opened my own store. But what did you do then um, for jobs when you got to that point, when you're in college? What did you try to finished college you went for like kinesiology am i wrong yeah 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 i got a degree in kinesiology uh i went to i went there for four years graduated in the summer oh so you did do um, the whole four-year experience yeah i did the whole four-year experience and um you know but my my gpa dropped drastically in in in, in, in college i had like a 2.5 2.6 at the end of it and i think a lot of it man when i got in college I, I was so into like transferable skills i wanted things that uh could I could apply in, in multiple fashions and like taking chemistry and physics and right. you know that stuff doesn't translate very well I feel like to the real world unless you actually get into those specific technical jobs which I wasn't so you know there was a lot of just not being motivated being dis disinterested in, in a lot of the, the courses same. that they were yeah. teaching me so but kinesiology did excite me I just took some really good classes the, the best class I took in college was public speaking I'll never forget that class it was just like an elective class. I think it was maybe two credits, but I took the most out of that two credit course yeah. than any of the other courses I took throughout my four year college, just because of the transferable skills uh, that I received from public speaking. Like yeah. we had to stand up, talk in front of the class. They recorded us, there would be an evaluation. You got to go back, look at the video, see what you did right, did wrong. Yeah. A lot of people say, uh, ums, huh? they, you know, you do that a lot and you don't really realize it until you're like up me being video recorded and they're they're evaluating you based off of that stuff so i picked up on it like that taught me so much it's like man i've got to learn how to speak better you know i've got to be confident when i'm speaking in front of people um you know then there's just a structure that they, they that class taught me so yeah i remember i took that my sophomore year and that was like that was by far the best class i took i think communication is the most important skill that we don't teach in general so I didn't take public speaking, but I do think that the most valuable class I took was interpersonal communications, mm. which is the same general type of thing, right? right it's teaching right. you how can you get the most out of a conversation with a person. Exactly. And I thought interpersonal as far as sales and stuff, because I wasn't speaking in front of you know larger groups. I thought that was extremely useful to me. And then as far as the ums and all that, I really figured that out when I started <laughs> editing a podcast. And I'm like, I, I found a bunch of different mannerisms that I used uh, way too often. And yes. I, I try to avoid them now, but I pick up on it. And when I interview other people, I can hear that and yes. it sticks out to me. <laughs> ums, likes, yeah. uh, you know what I'm saying? Yep. There's all <laughs> these manner, absolutely. Yeah, and so, I, I mean, it's just a cool story, but like, why did you get, why and how did you get a rental property when you were 20? Uh, I just don't know anyone else that's done that. All tribute to my mother. My mother was in the real estate business when I was young. She was a loan originator. And so I seen her purchasing properties. I was very interested. She wanted her, she had two sons, me and my brother. And she wanted us, you know, she wanted to really get us off to a good start. And so she was just proactive. At 16, she put me on a credit card. This is a trick that people now talk about today, about yeah. like increasing your, your kid's credit when they turn 18. She had me on her on her credit card at 16. So by the time I was 18, I had a credit score in the 700s. So sure. it made it much more easier to purchase a property by the time I was 21. And my first property, um, I was 21, junior in college, and I, and I bought a duplex you know, in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It wasn't in the best neighborhood, sure. but it was a duplex. It was cash flowing. I was making about $800, $900 a month on a good month. And Were you renting both sides or were you living in one, renting the other? I was renting both out. Yeah, so he, technically I was supposed to start off living in one of the units, but uh, at the <laughs> no real, real estate at that you. time, back in, in uh, when was that, 2005, 2006, sure. it was a little different then. So. so then what happened with that property? Well, okay, so you finished your degree. You didn't immediately move out to L.A. at that time. What did you do after you finished your degree? Did you have more properties at that point? Did Man. you just have the one? 
it just goes back to like finding your passion. Right. So uh, I was happy about being, you know, a, a landlord, being an owner and collective rent. And then when things break, I would I would really try to go out there and try to learn, you know, how to fix stuff, fix, fix plumbing and change out toilets and, and paint units, turn them, yeah. uh, patch roofs. I was doing it all. And I and I found, you know, good passion. I'm like, I really like this. I want to continue to do it. Uh, but when I graduated, obviously I had to make some money. I mean, $800 a month isn't going to take me anywhere. Yeah. So, you know, like others, man, I just jumped around. I worked at Wells Fargo Home Mortgage for a couple of months in the collections department. I figured that wasn't for me. I worked at another uh, collection company called Alliance One, and I didn't like the aggressive nature of, the, of the, what they uh, were trying to teach us as far as, like, trying to collect debt. It was just kind of like, it was like I went to college to get a degree, not to, to be a a debt collector so I got out of that so I, I bounced around and um, I found Target you know I ended up working for Target as executive team leader and that was one of the best jobs that I had as far as again learning transferable skills yeah. um, because I was a manager and I was 22 23 managing a team of uh, 20 25 team members Okay. Um, and so that's a big responsibility. to, to yeah. And I had three different departments. I worked at um, uh, Super Target in Shoreview. Um, so there was like a, a meat department, bakery department, and Starbucks. And those were my responsibilities. And on certain days of the week, I was like the leader on duty where I had to like manage a whole store. Sure. And so it was just, it was just incredible training just learning business learning how to speak to business being able to identify problems challenges find solutions um and manage people you know yeah. like the big thing with target at that time was like either coach up or coach out if they if things weren't working out with them and i got to learn like really the kind of cold-heartedness of the corporate world yeah of like if somebody's not working you got to get them out like no questions asked you know some of the human element of like compassion and all that kind of gets lost sometimes in business because it's business right if you're yeah. not performing <laughs> you know yeah. your head's going to be next on the chopping block if you don't get rid of the, the the source of why your department isn't working out so right. i had to learn very quickly like yeah. how to this cutthroat like environment and it taught me so much that I still apply to this day. This is 15, 16 years later. There are certain things I learned from Target that just uh, is just incredible. I mean, I think everything's a stepping stone. <laughs> yeah. That's the crazy part. You don't like think about it at the time, like what you're going to be doing in 15 years or whatever and how this is going to affect it. Right. But like I think about it and I'm like, man, I was in sales from when I was super young. And then all of a sudden, you know, like I said, I was I was an assistant manager at Hellsberg Diamonds. So I'm sitting down and I'm trying to like work with all these young guys that are really uncomfortable spending dollar amounts that they're you know what I mean? They're mm. nervous about it, just about the relationship, whether or not they're ready to purchase that. And I'm mm. sitting down and having these navigating these types of conversations with people. Why would that apply to anything else later on? And right. then all of a sudden I'm doing podcasts and I'm getting guests comfortable speaking. Right. When they're showing up and a lot of these people are creatives, artists and stuff, like they don't public speak. Right. And all of a sudden that skill translated of like getting people comfortable. Right. And I'm like, well, that was like not what I expected it to be. So then I'm trying to picture the timeline here. So you're what, 23, 24 when you're working, doing this this management job at Target. Exactly. And that's around the time frame then you went to L.A. Was it for Target or like why did why'd you end up deciding like oh. you're in a good situation why would you want to leave to LA yeah even though I was learning so much at Target I was struggling performance wise and okay. so um, you know there was there, they did things in buckets so I remember one of the buckets was managing um, I think it was managing talent and the other one was um, c communicating effectively and communicating effectively was the primary one yeah. that they were coaching me on they were just like we feel like you're not too par uh, as far as communicating to your team member, to communicating to your direct boss, you know, putting out plans. Um, it, it, for example, yeah, I, I can't, I can never forget some of these these lessons I learned from there. Um, you know, we would work every other weekend, and so um, there was a week where I was working during the week and I had the weekend off. And um, when I came back on Monday, you know, they said like your your department, your bakery department, was a complete disaster over the entire weekend. Like, you know, nothing was prepared on time. Nothing got up and ready on time. Uh, There's a lot of out of stocks on the bakery table. Yeah. Like, it was not a good weekend for your bakery department. And I, and I was just like, I wasn't even here. Like, why are y'all holding me accountable? There's a leader on duty. And, uh, man, one of the very mo most important 
moments when I was at Target, she explained to me, it was like, this is still your responsibility. You should have prepared the bakery on Friday, set up a plan, because you know the bakery's already struggling uh, up until now. Like, it's been a struggling department, so you didn't set up any plans. You did not uh, follow up with the leader on duty for the weekend to tell him to watch out for A, B, and C. Like, right. you just didn't prepare anything for the leader on duty, and this is the reason why I struggled. And I'm like, you know, again, I'm 23 at 424 at the time, just like feel like they're picking on me. Yeah. But then I had to really take a step back, and that taught me a clear, clear, clear lesson on accountability. Like, when you're, when you are the head of something, <laughs> you know, you're, you're accountable to everybody that's below you. And yeah. you've got to just take it on the chin. And so I learned that lesson. And that helped me strides and bounds, leaps and bounds when it came to accountability. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, you have to, like, realize the world's always still moving, regardless of whether you're, whether you're there or not. And your responsibilities go along with that. Right. You know, only in very low tier positions can you clock out and truly be clocked out. <laughs> yeah. Right. If you want to exactly. do something grander than that. The world's moving, and the things you've been working on are continuing to evolve when you're not there, and yep. you have to be able to check up on those things. And it's tough when you want to work 9 to 5, clock out, and be done. But And you, you can, but only if you then really did the work already for the weekend set it to up. make sure, right? right? And right. that's something that you learn over time. When you're young, it's hard to receive criticism, right? Life long lessons, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, to answer your question, though, um, I worked for Target for a year and a half. And uh, crazy, in a year and a half, I learned so many lessons. But sure. uh, they put me on a performance plan. And they ultimately fired me. I knew they were firing me, um, so I had to start thinking about next plans. And all during that same time, I had a long-term relationship that was breaking up as well. So it felt like my world was crashing down. Sure. Like I was like, I don't have anything. But then it just clicked to me. It was just like, oh, this is the perfect time to get out of the state of Minnesota. Yeah. You, you essentially got to press restart now. You're going, you're coming off this heartbreak, yeah. and then this. This uh, corporate company you're so excited about doesn't want you anymore. Like, perfect time. Let's press reset, refresh, and get up out of here. And so I identified a few cities. Knew I wanted to go to a big city, but ultimately came down to Austin, Texas, and, and Los Angeles, California. And I had people that already lived in Los Angeles, so that's really what gave uh, uh, Los Angeles the advantage. So I came out, visited. It was October of 2009 during uh, Halloween weekend, <laughs> and just had a blast. You know, it was Halloween. I'm, yeah. 24 uh and we just had a blast and i was like yeah i definitely want to move here this is it we spent time in hollywood they shut the hollywood boulevard down at that age it was just like oh yeah this is this is it i'm seeing palm trees weather it was just everything so um at that so age I, is exciting yeah. <laughs> versus nowadays you walk down hollywood boulevard <laughs> and it's like i don't know i don't know okay so you decided <laughs> after this halloween event of like LA is exciting like that's for sure it's limitless possibilities but then what actually happened with the move did you get a job lined up ahead of time were you sleeping in a closet for a few hundred bucks like a lot oh, of people do man. or what so yeah when I moved out here I, I had maybe two thousand dollars to my name um I packed that gets everything. you nowhere yeah it doesn't get <laughs> you anywhere I had a Mazda 6 uh that I was leasing um and uh put everything in that Mazda 6 anything every, every personal belonging I could possibly fit in there and then I drove to Los Angeles, and so it was uh, two 12-hour days, so it took me about 24 hours to get here. I don't know, that's 2,500 miles, something like that. But I stopped in Denver, slept, and then another 12 to L.A., yeah. and I was here, you know, and uh, I slept on uh, one of my high school friend's couch for the first six months. I uh, didn't have a job. Uh, he was a good friend to let you be there six months. Yeah, and I was paying him. What did we... Our agreement was on, I was paying him two... I think it was two seventy five a month to sleep on his car. <laughs> Paid him two seventy five, which isn't bad here in Los Angeles. No, you can no, get no. a roof over your head for two seventy five. I'll take it. Yeah, that's what I'm but saying. But at the time, he had another person sleeping on the other couch, and then you know it was a two bedroom, and it was another. So it was like four of us all living in a two bedroom apartment, just trying to put things together. That's the hustle. That's why you know these people are going to succeed, though, right? It's those yeah. people that are willing to do that. Because most people would come out here, they'd run out of that money within a month and say, I'm not I'm not sleeping on a couch anymore, know, I'm going back home. What made you want to stay, though? Did you get a, um, a good job that you were excited about? or like? What? Yeah, so you know, I, I had a good set. The fact that Target let me go, I was able to collect unemployment. So I knew I had a little bit of money that was coming in. Okay. Um, I think he let me stay there for the first month for free. So, you know, I had a little, <laughs> sure, a little, <laughs> a little deal going on there. And uh, I had a couple of job interviews lined up. So within two weeks, I had a part-time job at Kohan as a sales representative selling shoes and uh, men and women's shoes, Kohan. Yeah. And I was out in Pasadena. And, you know, I was just getting by. So then I was supplementing that with the unemployment that I was getting. And so, you know, money was coming in. You know, I was 
I'm frugal by nature, so it wasn't sure. like I was just spending money crazy anyway. And then I found the Hershey company that I interviewed for, and so it took that Hershey uh, interview took about three or four months. So I just kept working at Kohan, hoping that Hershey was going to get me through the next round and ultimately hire me. And then they hired me in like August of 2010, and then um, they were supplying me a company car, computer. That's when everything really. Is this uh, Hershey chocolate or what other? Yeah, Her yeah Hershey. It was Hershey chocolate. Oh, I, was, okay. I was a sales representative. So they gave me a territory here in Los Angeles where I called on uh, grocery stores. You know, there's five oh, yeah. main grocery stores out here. And I called on them and just uh, upselling uh, the Hershey product, trying to build uh, uh, different displays throughout the stores to yeah. continue to, to push Throw sales. Throw a bigger presence in each yeah, location. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just keeping things in stock and selling certain programs. And so, you know, I was working from store managers up to district managers. And so it was it was a legit job and it was sure. candy. So it was an easy sell, you know, and in that yeah. confectionery, um, confections category, you know, people, it's, it's recession proof. People even get depressed. They want candy. So... And it's kind of it like was, your own boss in a way when you're in that, was, you know was. what I mean? Because then you're kind of on your own time. It's up to you to contact these. As long as sales numbers are there, a lot of autonomy. You get some freedom, right? That, yeah, and that came to my demise. But a lot of, a lot of autonomy at the Hershey Company. For sure. <laughs> sure. So how long? So well, what happened with the duplex? Did you still own it when you moved? Yeah. So when I moved, I I, uh, I still had it. I had my mother watching it, but then things just went downhill. So the market was crashing. Yeah. Uh, the value of my home, I got an appraisal. It, it cut in half, and oh. then I had a three-year adjustable rate mortgage, and then that adjusted. So my interest rate shot up. So my payments went, you know, uh, almost double you know just overnight and yeah. so i was no longer cash flowing the property value went down in half i started having all these repair issues again i only got like two thousand dollars to my name at that time i was using credit cards just to try to stay afloat and so at a point it didn't make financial sense anymore so did you take a loss uh, on it yeah I, 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 it foreclosed i stopped making the payments because then the last straw was i moved out here and within a couple of months someone stole all the copper out of the basement and then that was just the last straw. I was just like, I can't. I'm just going to let it go. Sure. I um, notified the tenants, you know, told them they should probably find another uh, place yeah. to stay. And then I just let it go. How come you didn't just stray away from real estate then at that point? I feel like that would be a pretty big kick to the stomach where you're like, I don't want to touch that. Well, I had anymore. a condo at the time, too, in Uptown, and that was doing well. I had a, a oh, Section okay. 8 tenant that was in there. And um that was still doing well, but the market was crashing. You know, it was just at that time period of time, no one wanted to touch real estate, including me. I was just yeah. like, man, this is stupid. Well, this was 2009, you know? roughly, right? Yeah, this is 2010, 2010 yeah, 2011. Yeah, right no, real estate yeah. bottomed out in 2011. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just like, oh, this is stupid. So, you know, I was just like, I'm, I'm kind of over it. You know, I, I, I went into it with so high hopes, but like to see your value get cut in half like that, yeah, that hurt, man. I was so, just like, man, this is stupid. <laughs> so you're cozy at Hershey then. Why did you want to get back? into real estate again and you didn't get into purchasing then you just got into selling yeah so uh at hershey i knew at some point i was gonna have to leave you know i didn't you know it was one of those jobs where it was cushion the sales representatives in my market you know some of them have been there 10 15 20 years many of them were older than me so i kind of looked at i was like yo this is gonna probably be me if i stay in this company yeah and uh it, LA standards it wasn't making enough money you know i mean i had much bigger goals and at that point i was really trying to find like my purpose you know sure. I, I was very like, i couldn't like and with rico you know he would do these entrepreneur anonymous circles where they all get in the circle and they would talk about like their entrepreneur endeavors and he would invite me and even though i wasn't like technically an entrepreneur i just appreciate him inviting me because it just gave me like the motivation and the passion as i'm listening to them their successes their failures their challenges like it was amazing and every time i go to the circle it's like i'm not there yet guys but you know i'm still trying to find my purpose and like I'm just lost and I just I just you know I'm I'm full of ambition but I just don't know where to direct it sure you so know? at what point then did you did you just like YouTube how do I become a realtor and start <laughs> like googling around uh, or what, like what, what my, happened one of my favorite books is the alchemist uh and in, in the book alchemist it talked about omens like picking up on signs yeah, and the one. environments around you yeah and uh I, I read that book and so I was on high alert when it came to that and um I'm in a fraternity uh, I joined in college, and when I came out here, they have alumni chapters out here. So I joined an alumni chapter, and it was one gentleman that was doing real estate, and I was just really intrigued. I'm like, oh, you got your own business? And, like, he had, like, eight, nine real estate agents at his business boutique. 
And, you know, I just talked to him one day and it started, it just connected. You know what I mean? Again, it, I think this was just the omen. It was just like, man, I should be a real estate agent. I never had thought about it prior. Like I was, you know, I invested and I'm like, this might be it. Like I was like, it was just a light bulb that went off. Like this might be it. You know, I was at Hershey at that time at four years now. Yeah. And I was just, I was like, I got to get out of here. And um, he was like, yeah, you know, I'll set you up on the trainings and all that stuff. And we'll get you your license within three or four months. And it just clicked, you know, just one of the things I just knew. Like, it's, it's like I think in moments like we just have these, um, these these decisions that we have to make. You know, you can make good decisions and then you, sometimes you just got to make, you know, strong decisions. I think and, and a strong decision for me was to move out to Los Angeles. Like, it's just I knew I had to do it. I don't think much was going to deter me. Yeah. And at that moment, it just clicked. Like, the strong decision had to be to get my real estate license. And yeah. I, there was nothing stopping me once I came to, to terms with it. And so I got it, and, and yeah, that's, that's how I got into to being a real estate agent. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you grow unless you push yourself beyond what's your comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. People always say that. Take yourself out of your comfort oh, yeah. zone. That's yeah, when you yeah, grow yeah. the fastest. And mm -hmm. so just because you haven't done it before doesn't mean you can't do it. And if you've been doing sales for a long time, it's the same type of thing, right? Except with Hershey, you're doing it for a company that you may or may not believe in that you're like, do I want to be the chocolate guy like is that what i want to do is sell chocolate the rest of my life or in something like real estate you know you really are kind of owning your own business much more so and and you could be very freely owning your own business Absolutely. after that right because you're selling a product that isn't Absolutely. owned by any individual company necessarily yes you know even if you yes. did work for somebody else for however long those relationships that you build with other people those can translate if you want to go on your own at any point in right. time so right. how long did you work because you work underneath this guy training right uh, or how did what happened yeah. as far as going on to your own selling your first properties or going into it? I yeah. know that it took a little while, right? Yeah, so the transition was crazy. Um, I got my license in 2014. I was still working at Hershey. Um, and so I was just like, I'm going to work Hershey. Again, I got a lot of autonomy at Hershey. So yeah. it's going to allow me to be able to still practice real estate. And then on the weekends, I'll just do open houses. And so the fact that I had that kind of job was critical because there was a learning curve in real estate that when many people that get their license here, they, the, the stats is one in 20 people in California have their real estate license, you know, oh. which I thought was just mind boggling. Well, most of them part, that's practice part time, but yeah, that's a ridiculous number. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about, think about industries as a whole, like one in 20 people have their real estate license. And so I knew there's gonna be a learning curve. I'm not from here. I don't have sphere of influence. I don't have a lot of friends that are buying houses. I, you know, I just don't have the network. So I'm gonna have to really get out here and grind and prove my worth. And so the goal was to, I'm going to continue work at Hershey. I'm just going to do real estate part-time and just learn, learn yeah. from those around me. And, um, you know, I, I got off just working every weekend, uh, working every week, essentially, just, just trying to figure it out. Like open houses. Was this houses. underneath that guy you met? Yep. Yep. This okay. is under his broker. So he had a boutique brokerage, uh, in Carson, California sure. that I was working for. So at least he was giving you some guidance as far as like where you could go yeah. to learn then. Yeah. But it was okay. interesting because even the way his brokerage was set up, like he was the top dog, he was doing the most deals and everybody else was just kind of doing minimal deals. Some of them doing all right, but he was like, okay. so he didn't really have a lot of time to train because he was doing the most deals and that required yeah. time and effort. And so with real estate with people learn is that you have to own your own development people think that people are just going to set up these classes you're going to learn and you're going to know everything you need to know you got to really go out there and fight for all the knowledge you're going to learn you know because mm -hmm. it just none of it's going to come easy you know they have these courses that they they mandatory make you take before getting your license but none of that applies to you once you actually get your license as far as being successful as a real estate right, agent yeah, yeah. you know so i had to learn all of that and it just was about owning my own development and so i struggled very first year i didn't close one deal yeah. you know i fell out of three escrows um and then like if you calculate that in that time that was about you know twenty five thirty thousand dollars worth of commission that you know that fell out and so at the end of the year i had a big fat zero and the only thing that was holding me up was that i had worked, was working for hershey uh but I, you know at that time it was like i spent more time that year doing real estate than actually working at hershey but yet sure <laughs> I made no money sure. doing it right so uh i had to make a decision after that first year it was like man do you want to continue to do this or not and the way the universe works like the universe conspires um hershey ended up finding out so i was doing really well at hershey and they wanted to promote me and the only way they would promote me is i had to relocate so i was kind of like uh trying to save time and you know trying to just say all the right things and they were trying to send me back to hershey pennsylvania which i declined and so then 
someone ended up from the management team and ended up finding out I was doing real estate. And at that point, they were like, all right, we got to get him out of here. He's not He's, he's not, not serious. committed. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So they figured out. And then they did their HR thing to figure out a way to let me go. Sure. Um, which then at that time, you know, at that time it was a blow. And I remember talking to my mom. You know, this is another one of those just um, very, like, important times that you'll forever remember. I was on the phone with my mom. And I'm like, Hershey just let me go. I haven't really been successful with real estate. Do I go and find another like Hershey like job, you know, in the CPG category, consumer product goods category, which I knew I could have went to like Kellogg, uh, probably could have went to Coca Cola. Like I knew I could find another yeah. job. But I'm like, do I go back and do that and just get back on this like, uh, you know, this treadmill, hamster wheel? And she was like, she encouraged me, like, you should go for it, go full time real estate. And, um, I'm like, ah, this is going to be another good transition because I knew I was going to get, like, the unemployment. So it was like, all right, that's going to hold me. So there's this common theme of getting unemployment, which allowed <laughs> me to, like, take these leaps of faith. You know, but it's it's about being resourceful, right? Yeah. Seeing, like, yeah. a op- window of an opportunity and pouncing on that opportunity. I always mm-hmm. tell people that the most successful people are the ones who identify the right opportunities and pounce when they're in front of them. Right. Because opportunities come your way all the time. Most of them are bad, you know, but the really good opportunities, if you don't pounce somebody else's, so mm-hmm. you have to be able to identify and say, okay, well, this is a window that I have. I'm going to take advantage of this window right now and use this resource, right? Yeah. So then how did life, like, how did the pursuit change when all of a sudden it was like, well, now I only have, you know, a limited amount of time before I have to start actually making money. What did you, what did you change about how you were do, oh, going about man. it? Oh, man, you know, this is when I just, I, I tightened my belt up. And so I think, you know, I think a lot of people's success is, it comes down to like their discipline and, and their ability yeah. to think through the plan you know there's that saying plan your work and then work your plan and so i had to sit down and really structure like what this plan is going to look like one i knew i had to keep my expenses as low as possible so immediately i thought about like how am i going to do that because at the time i was in a one bedroom and i think the rent was like 13 1400 dollars and i'm like there's no way i can do real estate you know getting commission checks and it could it could take one month it could take three months there's no way i'm going to be so stressed out you know that it's going to deter it's going to take away from my ability to learn and succeed so then i had a bright idea it was like property management let me go find a place that i can live in for free i bought i i owned a duplex i owned a condo i can put on my resume that i owned a couple of units and i did property management there's my end yeah you know what i mean it was another one of those aha moments and so i went out there and i found a property management uh, position down in Long Beach where uh, the rent uh, was essentially free. You know, based off of like everything that was structured, I was pretty much not paying any rent. Sure. And it was a two bedroom apartment that they remodeled for me. So it was like a nice setup too. Yeah. And uh, it was just a blessing. That came at the exact right time because um, I had to do something, right? I couldn't, you know, otherwise I just wasn't going to be successful in real estate. So the fact that that happened, it, it relieves so much pressure, you know, knowing that now I don't barely have any bills sure. and I could just focus. And that's what I did. Just 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 uh, put my head down and start focusing. What hard. were the what were the tools you used to then learn what you actually needed to learn to break into finally selling some property? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it came down to being resourceful. So there's a couple of big moves that I made, you know, working at the boutique. It started to not work out because I just feel like the resources weren't there. Yeah, um, I think he was I, I felt like he was leading me in the in the wrong direction. I think he was doing things that worked for him as a seasoned agent. Sure. But it was not going to work for a newer agent. And so I had to get very resourceful and I start reaching out to those around me that were also real estate agents and just just trying to learn, like, how, how are you doing deals? Where are you getting your deals from? And then I found this this platform called Redfin and they did this partner program where they would give you leads that you didn't have to pay for it's just once you closed it there was a 70 30 split i was like oh that's genius I, like again i'm trying to keep my expenses low so sure. I, I can pay for leads or i don't have to pay for leads but i get these leads and i just got to break up the, the the back end of it genius and so i i signed up for that they interviewed me they, they brought me on to their partner program and then just i took that program and said this is what's going to get me to the next level and uh, start taking on those leads. And then I was doing so well that they reached out to me and they asked me to come to their brokerage. And uh, that was like the, the catalyst. That was the big shift of my real estate career because I moved from this boutique and I moved over to this platform called Ref and Brokerage that had tons of resources. They had this big website, gets, gets tons of leads, 
yeah. you know so the lead generation is there and now i get to get funneled into that and i just and i just have to have the ability to work leads at a high level um you know they're they're pretty much cold leads you know you, and you get them you take them in make a phone call and really try to win them over and so that was the beginning of like my elevation you know when i when i joined them you know yeah. that was i knew you know sometimes when you know when you, when you get a, a position or a promotion or just an opportunity you know that it's going to take you to the i knew immediately like this is going to take me to the next level yeah like i said it's, a, it's about <laughs> when you can identify the right opportunities and a lot of times it's just because like you said the resources aren't available to you most people don't want to work hard enough the resources are around yeah. to do just about anything you can go learn how to pl fly a plane if you really wanted to right you can google where to like do the resources are available if you're willing to put the time and energy into getting those and cold calls at least you have somewhere to call right at least you have somewhere to start and a lot of times that's all you need are those breadcrumbs to get going you know right. it's just a matter of if you have no idea where to go in the first place that's mm -hmm. where it can get really stuck it, right. people always say it's like the first step of the journey that's all it takes right is just putting that first step once you go the momentum carries you and now things are happening and whatever whatever so how did it grow then because you didn't immediately like you didn't join them and then immediately have you know 15 million sales 40 million sales like that's a long time frame and a lot that changed right so did you kind of go off totally on your own or like how did you how did you excel from like that kind of level to being like kind of a top dog yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, so so one of the sayings that I, you know, I kind of live by is if you can do anything once, you can definitely replicate it and do it again. And I know it's it's like it's simple, but it was just like, you know, when I first closed my first deal, you know, that was a major moment for me because it's like if I did this once, if I finally was able to do this, I can do this again. Then I can do it again and I can do it in a much more frequency and I can do it more times in just a month. And then it just, you know, yeah. snowballs from there. And so at Redfin, um, I, I seen, you know, some of the deals that some of the, the seasoned agents were doing. Yeah. And, you know, I talked to them. I felt them out, sat down with them, had lunch. And sometimes, you know, you just you talk to people and you learn about their success and something clicks where it's just like, you know what, I can I can do that. Sure. I can do what they're doing. I think I got the skill set to do so. Um, you know, because it's like a lot of the success, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science where you just got to be incredibly intelligent. Or you got to be incredibly something. It's just they package it in a way and they worked hard and they got there. So as I'm talking to them and I'm learning from them, I'm just like, all I got to do here is just work hard, keep my head down, be strategic uh, and continue to learn. You know, like one of my favorite sayings is, uh, um, to love, to be loved, and never stop learning. That was like a model for me in life. And that to never stop learning was like one of the big parts of that. You know what I mean? I have to always be in position to be learning because I'm never going to know it all. And the world's changing too fast to have mastered anything and continue to think you're going to master. You just got to continue to learn. So I, I went into at this no, new brokerage knowing that I was going to have to be a student and I'm just going to have to learn everything around me. And it's just the work ethic. I think I have a grind that is just... I, you know, it's a high motor. Like, I'm just high motor. I just know success was big to me. I didn't come out here to L.A. to fail. I right. knew that from the very beginning. In 2010, I remember I would speak that. I did not come out here to fail. I have to be successful under any cost. Even if I sacrifice some times with my friends, if it's sacrifice relationships, I'm going to be successful. I'm not walking away from making this huge transition and losing, you know, yeah. and that was my mentality when I when I joined the broker. That was my mentality. Like I'm learning everything, and so like the way the elevation worked is for 2015. I did zero deals. 2016, I did three. 2017, uh, I was like seven, and then I did uh, 17, and then I did 24, and then I did 36, 37, and, and like in the last 12 months, I've done like 44 transactions, which is $50 million worth of, of uh, sales volume in the real estate world. And, you know, if you compare that to a lot of agents, there's not a lot of agents in that, in that, sure. in that space. Yeah. But having that confidence and like that drive to be able to say, for one, I think there's a, a healthy competitive uh, drive there. There's healthy and there's unhealthy. There's unhealthy when you say, man, that person's doing it. Why, why can't I do it? That's unhealthy. But if you say this person's doing it, I can do it then because they're doing it. I'm just as smart. If I work hard enough, why can't I? I can. That's when it's healthy and that's when it's motivating, right? And I am like 
overly competitive. I hate to lose. Yeah. I will not admit to anybody that anyone is better than me at like inherently. Yeah, some people are better at math or some people are better at individual things, yes. but in general, I think I am just as capable as any other person out there. Right. And that keeps my motor going all the time. Like Same I'm going to do this. Like it doesn't matter. I'm going to figure it out, right? So excuse me. Um, but when you have that idea of like, well, if I can do this one thing, why can't I do it again and again and again? I mean, it just makes sense that you're only going to be better at this thing because you already learned how to do it one time. And a lot of people think that it's luck when it's not luck, right? It's just about like recognizing the situation going, well, this was really hard. I should expect next time to be hard, you know, mm -hmm. but maybe it's going to be a tiny bit easier. And then when you don't have a ceiling because you don't have to set a ceiling for yourself, you can keep growing. Mm -hmm. The problem is a lot of people, I think, get complacent because they worked really hard and all of a sudden things get easier and then they feel it get easier and then they kind of lay off because they get into the space where they're like, well, it's working, right. you know, but they don't necessarily want more. Right. What kept you wanting more? Because at some point you don't, I mean, you don't have to have $50 million in sales volume <laughs> yeah. to get by, right? But yeah. like you wanted to, why Why did you want to keep getting it better and better? Uh, it's just really a lot of it's like there's just a, a competitive nature in me and I got that from basketball you know my first love in life I think was basketball sure that competitive nature of wanting to win and, and wanting to win at all costs what I have to do to get better so that I can win and you know the, it's those sports dynamics that translated well for me into the real estate world it was just like I want to continue to get better each each year because again I do a lot of research. I study, you know, I study people around me. I study the successful agents around me. Like I'm nowhere near uh, one of the top agents in L.A., which sure. means that there's still room for me to grow. There's still this extension that I can continue to take to take this thing to a next level. And I think I'm only at my beginning. You know, I'm still in the real estate world. The average real estate agent is like 50 something. So it's just like. I'm one of the younger successful agents and then it's just so much more room to grow and so I, I think about that and that is what builds builds that fire it's like man you're doing well now but just imagine in a couple of years if you just continue to figure this thing out where you'll be and that that excites me it's just like wow you yeah. know what i mean because just the way i'm designed you know once i get the levels like i reach down you know and i want to pull other people up Sure. You know, and, and, and get them to certain levels as well. So Yeah, but you, I mean, one of the best ways to learn is by teaching. Yeah. You always learn things when you teach. Things have changed a little bit since you got into real estate, but a lot of those resources and stuff are still there. So if somebody wanted to get into real estate right now, what are the first, like, few action steps people could take? Always, you know, a lot of new agents reach out to me because I do have a social media platform, uh, Instagram, where I got I got a decent amount of followers. Um, the at is T-Banks in L.A. And uh, people reach out, they DM me, they ask me just, you know, yeah. how to be successful. Can you give me some tips? And one of my, one of my you know, probably uh, best things is I say is that you just want to, you, you want to be an understudy to someone that's been doing this for a while. That's a top producer. You want to see if you can join their team. Even if it's like interning, like yeah. you know how a lot of these fields, how people break through is they start off interning and they yeah. build the, re the, the network and the connections and that's what ultimately gets them to where they need years down the line you know when you're around and you're getting that kind of exposure so i told them like gotta almost look at it as the same go find a top producer tell them you'll work for free yeah and, you know or start off as a, an assistant you know uh getting coffee or, or or doing administrative work just just find a way to get in you know yeah. and connect with that type of person and and don't you know Obviously, like, don't take no for an answer. Obviously, they're going to probably tell you no at the beginning if they're at capacity or whatever. But, like, stay consistent. Continue to reach out. You try to provide some sort of value to them. Every time you do that, if you consistently do that, at some point, they're going to open up and allow you in. And once you're in and you have that access, yeah. oh, that's, going to, that's what's going to take you uh, to the next level. And that's something I had to learn. It took a while for me to get here. Um, you know, I was at a small boutique and didn't have the resources. And it was really wasted time because I didn't have the exposure to know how to take this thing to the next level. So if I could go back, it was just like, I, I need to connect yeah. with someone that's doing this. Yeah, I mean, I, I say that to people about college a lot, right? And I'm not trying to like mm -hmm. say don't go to college or whatever, but it's funny, people go to college knowingly like I'm paying a bunch of money to learn and that's okay. And they think it's like worth spending money, right? Yeah. But then yeah, when yeah, you yeah. tell them like, hey, why don't you go find an internship or something? They're like, well, I can't work for free. And you're like, so wait a second, you're willing to pay for knowledge. Like you're gonna pay for knowledge at college. 
but you're not willing to just get knowledge for free. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you want to get knowledge for free, right? right? Like, the best way to get better at something is be around somebody who's better at it than you. Find yourself a mentor that knows and is doing something you want to do, and you'll be able to learn the quickest. And, yeah, 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 absolutely. Being an unpaid internship, it's like going to college for free. And then even if they're willing to pay you on top of it, accept a small wage. Who cares? Now you're getting paid to learn. Now you're getting paid to learn. You know, eventually you'll be in a position where you don't need to anymore and you've learned those things. But uh, you you don't learn anything immediately without trying. Finding a mentor or somebody in that that type of a situation, I think, is Mm -hmm. by far the best. And I always tell people, too, when they're in college, stop working random jobs that are, like, irrelevant to what you want to do. Just because that job pays two dollars more an hour, right? Find right. a job that those skills are going to translate towards wherever you want to be. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So you've had a lot of like really big moments, right? Obviously, I'm sure selling your first property and getting that first commission check was probably a fairly big one. <laughs> what's one of the high like? What's a a story of a high moment that you've had that sticks out to you? Um, a high moment. Oh, so, so the beauty of real estate, you know, is, is there, you know, it's two sides of a real estate transaction. There's uh, the sell side where you're working with the seller, and then there's the buy side where you're working with the buyer. And I've always found the most pleasure working with buyers because there's always like a, a story behind it, you know, about them getting to the ability to even afford, especially out here, to even afford a house. Yeah. It was a lot of hard work for them to get to this point where they're meeting me and now we're looking out and finding homes and always connecting with them and hearing their stories is, is always great. And um, <clears throat> I remember one specific story where um, she was a single lady living out here and um, she had a sister that lived on the other side of the country and they were like living in North Carolina. They were you know, pretty much in poverty, you know, yeah. over there. And, and her sister ended up passing and she had these two daughters and no no one in the family wanted to take the two daughters. And so she was just like, you know, I have to I have to take them. But she was living in like a one bedroom apartment and it just wasn't, it was gonna work in her space. And so, you know, she's like, this is time for me to buy. You know, I know it's, it's gonna be a challenge, but you know, can you help me? And so we start going through the, 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 the whole sequence of, of being a buyer and, and getting pre-approved and looking at homes and submitting offers and I was able to guide her you know I was able to guide her and, and able to get her something fairly quickly and I remember the two daughters flew out here and um, the day of closing you know when I got the keys and we all met there and she was just in tears and you know seeing the two daughters there I just lost their mother and um, seeing them being excited you know about living in this new community in California and I could see in their eyes that they had some hope, right? They seen, you know, some hope in the future, right? Even though they're going through this. And then, again, they didn't, they lived in, like, poverty. So coming out here, it just opened up their eyes. And they were just now just, you, you know, you've seen some hope. You've seen some energy. You've seen some motivation. You've seen some happiness, joy, like, so many emotions. And that was a moment, like, I was able to help in this process. Like, I assisted and I helped get this family to this position and it was just like i love what i do you know to have the ability to do buying a house is going to be one of the biggest like transactions most people are going to make yeah and it's such a life uh uh change you know so for me to be able to possibly impact that make the process easier for them or whatever i'm doing just as long as i'm adding some positivity to that like it gets no no greater now that was definitely a high moment for me just because of the magnitude of it, you know, yeah. seeing them, their lives change, especially after such a loss. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you're building a life within this home. It's not a transaction of like a car. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's not it's not selling jewelry or whatever. It's it's selling something that their their kids lives are going to grow up here. A lot of homes end up like following within family. I actually sold my first house and bought the one I grew up in. Yeah. So like I'm really in the same spot. My kids climb the same trees that I used to and stuff. Uh-huh. As a, right. And so there's yeah, so much great. emotion attached to it. So being able to be a part of it is really special. And, you know, when you if you're good at sales, you're not looking at anyone as a transaction, right? right? You're not looking at the short term, you're looking at the long term. And really, if you're a good salesperson, you're not selling the product, you're just identifying and finding what the best solution is for this person, right? right? And then that's when they want to go back to you anyways. That's how you build those types of relationships. And I'm sure that's how your name builds in the right positive way is you weren't looking at like, how do I make the, the most dollars right now? Right? It's more how do I build the reputation for things to come later on. I'm okay with making a little, less, little, little bit less money this month because I know long term 
this is the right way to go about it. Right, right. Um, so what are your goals then? I mean, obviously you want to make more than, you know, 50 million sales then next year. Like that would be an idea. But do you want to eventually have more of a staff underneath you? Do you want to, you know, get back into purchasing property and renting out property? Like what are you trying to do? Yeah, there, there's a couple of things as far as what I want to do next. Uh, you know, the first was just purchasing a property out here. And, uh, you know, I bought a house just in January over in the Mar Vista, Venice area, single family home. And that was a big deal for me because... I wanted to buy something in an area that, you know, I knew I was going to be like, it was going to be kind of difficult because of the price point. But um, if I accomplished it, I knew it was just going to be a big deal. And, and I knew I wanted to be in West L.A. Are, are um, you renting that or living in that? You mean Living. I'm living in okay, it. Cool. I bought it. I bought so it's it your January. own home. Yeah. Yeah. I bought it in January and it was a big deal. You yeah. know, it was, it was actually I finally bought it again after like... <laughs> What is it? 14, 15 years. You know, I had yeah. the duplex, I had the, I had the condo, and then I just went into the renting world. And then I was doing property management for six years, um, but I saved enough to put a healthy down payment down. I was able to buy uh, a, a nice house in, in the Venice area, and um, for me, it was just, it was just a big moment uh, because it didn't. It, it took a while to do. You know, it's it hard took, to do out here. For, I mean. <laughs> Shoot, I mean, that that time between, you know, buying the last one to this one, like, I took time, you know, I had to, when that market crash, it took a, I had to rebound, you know, and... Things uh, cost more here than Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me to get to that level and, and be able to purchase that and feel comfortable with that move, it, it kind of, you know, just showed me, you know, solidified some things for me is that I'm like, I'm... I'm accomplishing some of the bigger dreams that I had, and it was, you know, I was talking to a friend, it was, it was a little awkward at a, at a you know um it was it was a little awkward because <clears throat> sometimes when you realize bigger dreams yeah. and, and it actually happens you know there's this surreal moment but then it's also like that like man what's what's next you know and it's just like that's just the awkward feeling because like especially if something you've been working on yeah you build it up in your for mind for such a long thing. time it's just every yeah. day like I'm, I'm working at this i'm chipping at it and shit and then once sure. you accomplish it it's like oh man um but luckily, man, just the way I'm designed, like there's there's these other big goals that I have as well. And, you know, it's just about multiplying that now and, and just building a portfolio. Um, you know, the other goal is to, to, I think, ultimately build a brokerage, you know, a high end brokerage. Of, uh, it doesn't have to be big. It could be 10 to 15 agents that are just highly functional. Sure. Uh, we deliver some great service and we just conquer certain areas of L.A. Sure. and just build a brand that will be known throughout the city. You know, that's something I think is, is years down the line. But I think, you know, as I'm continuing to elevate it, it'll become uh, closer in, in, in the in the rearview mirror and it'll 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 happen for me. So that's a big one. And then the, the third one is just really tapping into the high end market. I think that's what's next for me. You know, sure. being a top producing agent, I just sold my biggest uh, highest sold home uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Beverly Hills. It was a four point four point one million dollar house in Beverly Hills. And for me, that was a very emotional moment um, because it's hard to sell in Beverly Hills. But, you know, the thing that I think about is like where I come from, come from Minneapolis. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm um, you know, a lot of not a lot of people that look like me are actually successful in this real estate world, especially out here. I don't see a whole lot. And so, sure. Um, for me to be selling Beverly Hills, it was just like, man, because at times when I first started, I was so intimidated to be in, in very high end areas. Sure. That I just felt like I didn't belong. Yeah. That same Mazda six that I drove out here, like, yeah. um, well, I had a similar car when I first started real estate. Um, and then I had a, a Malibu, a Chevy Malibu. And I remember, you know, sometimes when I pull up to some of these high end homes, you know, the, the buyer that was stepping out, they would see my car and they would automatically yeah, not take you seriously. Yeah. <laughs> not take me seriously. And I was just like, no, I'm just gonna figure out a way to win them over with my personality, with my knowledge. But I wasn't breaking through. Right. And that's when I had to learn about like image and yeah. presence and how things are perceived. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're not gonna buy a two million dollar home for me if I'm pulling up in a Chevy Malibu. Yeah. You know what I mean? They would, you know, they're gonna probably question, do I have the ability to get them to the finish line? Yeah. And so I remember I had to go out and I ended up getting an Audi, and uh, the perception changed just by getting an Audi. You know, I start pulling up and it just, 
the respect level kind of changed and all of that. And so, I mean, I say all of that is that like, especially tapping into that high end market, it's it's like difficult. I used to be very intimidated, but like through repetition and continuing to get in front of those type of clientele, I became more comfortable. I've started to figure out what worked for me from a personality standpoint. Um, I think Minnesota really helped me with assimilating to people and their uh, personalities because um, in Minnesota, again, not a lot of people look like me. So there was a great deal of assimilation that I would have to uh, just just direct myself in order to like either be light or to be able to connect or, you know, just to get to another level. And so transferable skills again. And when I came out here, I was able to do all of that. So long winded answer to all of that. <laughs> But uh, I think there was a couple of gems in there. <laughs> no, I think so. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming out here. You did mention it before briefly, but if people want to reach out and in general, like see what you're doing, follow up with you, get in contact, how would they do that? What's the best way? Yeah, um, Instagram, uh, GBanksinLA is my handle, uh, G-B-A-N-K-S-I-N-L-A. Um, there you'll find you know a lot of my real estate content. Um, you know, I did do some mentorship with some young with some young boys. And so I do do some like personal development stuff as well. So the the title is Be Ambition Movement. And uh, that's really about just just tapping in kind of similar to this, you know, the, the whole the, the whole passion movement. And uh, it, it's really about just uplifting, encouraging, exposing people to opportunities that they wouldn't elsewhere elsewhere be able to find. And, and just a lot of that. So you'll see a lot of that on my page. But uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much, man. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.